Hi, uh, my name is Elizabeth Angel. I'm ERI's Communications and Program Manager. Welcome to today's Kahraman Marash Earthquake Sequence Buildings Briefing, the latest in our webinar series uh, with the three LFE reconnaissance teams and the GEAR teams that traveled to Turkey in the aftermath of the earthquakes this February. Uh, before we get started, I just want to take a brief moment to talk to you about ERI in case you're not familiar with us. ERI is the largest and leading nonprofit membership organization connecting professionals from a wide range of disciplines, both in the U.S. and around the world, who are working together to reduce earthquake risk and advance resilience. And Learning from Earthquakes is our flagship program, celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Uh, and Learning from Earth Earthquakes leads our post-earthquake reconnaissance work, which sends multidisciplinary teams of researchers and practitioners into the field after major earthquakes to study the impacts and learn lessons from that damage so that we can improve building practices and regulations and build safer cities. And this work is funded in part by the LFE Endowment Fund. So if you want to support making this work sustainable in the future, uh, continuing to produce webinars and reports and research like the stuff we're talking about today, you can donate that link to the endowment fund here. And now I'm going to turn it over to Eduardo Miranda of Stanford University, who is the co-chair of the Learning from Earthquakes Executive Committee. And he'll introduce a bit of the work we've done on this earthquake sequence in Turkey, as well as some of the speakers today. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Welcome, everyone, to this webinar third one on our series uh, regarding these earthquakes, tragic earthquakes in Turkey. Uh, first, I would like to uh, point out that we have already produced the report that you see on the screen, and we welcome you to download it from our website, uh, the LFE ERI website, uh, and you can download this report uh, for free. The Turkish earthquakes represent very important tragic events that we must learn from. And after the 99 earthquakes, the Turkish government initiated a big effort uh, of seismic instrumentation uh, that resulted in a great set of records that provides us with a unique opportunity to pair performance of buildings, infrastructure, and the built environment in general right next to ground motion intensity. So today in this third series, uh, webinar, we get to hear uh, from top experts that travel in one of seven different teams as part of ERI teaming with GEAR. And I won't take more additional time and pass it on to uh, the, the speakers today. The first one is going to be Parth Gudka. Go ahead, Parth. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Elizabeth, uh, for the introduction. Uh, greetings to everyone around the world. Um, this is uh, the team, uh, Dr. Halil Sezen, a team leader from Ohio State University, Professor Bora Gensterk from uh, USC, Rupa Garai from Song, Mike Miller from Arab, who's also the co-chair of ERI, Morgan Griffith from Exponent, and myself, Parth Gudka from IMA. The outline of today's presentation is going to be introduction started by me, and then breadth and depth of observations followed by uh, system level building performance, structural performance of reinforced concrete components, historical, industrial, religious, and other structures, and finally to be concluded uh, with performance of non-structural comp uh, components and conclusions. Uh, just to give you a little overview about the event, I'm sure uh, the people who have not attended the first two uh, webinars, um, the, uh, on February 6, 2023, Turkey was struck with like two major earthquakes. Uh, one was 7.8 magnitude early in the morning, 4.20 a.m., followed by us aftershock of 6.7 magnitude um, right 11 minutes later. And then um, nine hours later was the second big event, 7.5 magnitude. And these were like the largest events in earthquake uh, in Turkey since 1939. And the fault rupture was almost 400 kilometer comparable to the 1906 San Francisco event. Here you can see like the, all the earthquakes uh, in Turkey that have occurred with more than 1,000 uh, deaths. And as you can see, this event from uh, 2023, like three months ago, was like the greatest and uh, with, uh, causing the most destruction with more than 50,000 deaths. Actually, 
Apologize. Yeah. Here in the video, you can see the widespread destruction. This is a video from uh, the city of uh, Antakya in the Hatay region, which was saw the white, most widespread destruction. The 11 provinces in southern Turkey were affected by these earthquakes, almost 14 million people affected, and 3 million people uh, were displaced by the earthquakes. The death death toll uh, is rising, almost 55,000 deaths with 110,000 injuries. More than 200,000 buildings collapsed and the uh, damage caused by these earthquakes in terms of monetary damages is 34.2 billion comparable to 4% of Turkey's or the country's GDP. And these are the 11 provinces that were affected by these earthquakes. Here you can see the, each star represents the major uh, events with the orange star being the first earthquake, the blue star being the second event. The green star at the bottom in the Hatay region was the earthquake that was on the 20th of February. And this in the Malatya region, the white star represents the earthquake in, uh, on the 27th February, 5.6 magnitude. And all the other um, circles represent uh, the thousands of aftershocks that the region experienced over the next couple of months. Here you can see the PGA contours for the first event and then superimposed with the second event, 7.5 magnitude earthquake. And you can just see the area, all the PGA contours. Uh, the blue line represents uh, point, uh, 0 0.02 magnitude and above. So you can just see like uh, the area that was affected by these earthquakes. Uh, this slide represents the slip uh, for both the major events, the 7.8 magnitude and 7.5 magnitude earthquakes with the slips uh, exceeding almost uh, six to seven meters near the epicenters. This was a very, very heavily recorded uh, earthquake with the first event being recorded at almost 185 uh, ground motion stations the second at almost more than 300 ground motion stations, and the third uh, with 148 ground motion stations. On the left, you can see um, the locations of all the ground motion stations in, the, in Turkey. And then the green ones are the ones where um, the ground motion stations uh, recorded usable data, and the blue ones are non-usable, mainly due to their distance from the events. On the right, you can see the raw D50 of the PGA values of, uh, uh, recorded at each station for each event, going as high as like greater than 1.4 uh, PGA. Uh, this, the station 2708 is in uh, the uh, Karaman Marash region, I believe. And then here you can see uh, the, the, uh, the, yeah, the, the PGA, uh, or like the PGA values exceeding the 475 return period with uh, periods greater than half a second. And uh, yeah, this is the one in Antakya or the Hatay region where you can see the PGA values in the shorter period, less than half a second, exceeded even the two 475 return or uh, year return period uh, design uh, values. So yeah, uh, you can see the widespread destruction uh, caused in the region of Antakya. This is an image uh, and then here you can see the before and after the same in Antakya region, where you know even the state uh, the stadium now being used uh, as um, habitation for the displaced people. The number of buildings um, based on the occupancy uh, distribution in the affected regions can be seen here. Like ninety percent, almost eighty nine to ninety percent of the buildings are residential use, with a very small number being commercial, public, and other uh, uses. And then. This is the distribution of the buildings uh, based on the year constructed. And as you can see in the Hatay region, which saw the most widespread devastation, almost 45% of the buildings were built before 22,000. And that is one of the main reasons you can see, like of the 87% of the buildings with major damage to collapse, out of which like 42% were in the Hatay region. And yeah, you can see like, um, you can correlate like the year of construction and also the PGA values experienced by that region uh, didn't help either. And that's the reason that region suffered the most widespread damage. Here, uh, the team again, uh, the ERI building team on the field. And we would also like to thank Professor Jonathan Stewart from UCLA and the gear team. Just one second. Thank you for your patience, guys. So yeah, the main, uh, 
goal of the presentation was to, uh, or of the field was to uh, observe the wide range of buildings and the types of occupancies. Focus was on the newer construction, good design and good construction as well. And then uh, locations that had experienced very strong levels of shaking as well as moderate levels of shaking. And then we would, uh, would like to correlate the structural damage with ground motion intensity as you uh, see from the following speakers. Here you can see the uh, cities or like the towns that we visited circled in red. And yeah, the earthquake intensity is greater than 0.2 G, um, the contours of those, and you can see the area are like affected by these earthquakes. This is the route taken by the ERI buildings team on day one. Our base was Adana. And the base was Adana, and then on day one, we went to Hatai region. And since that region had suffered so much damage, uh, we also went or uh, visited the same region on day two. Different uh, cities or different towns, Kirikan, Samandagi. And then on day three, we moved our base from Adana to Gaziantep while also observing Osmani and Karamash on our way. Day four was the toughest where we went to Adiyaman, uh, Malatya, and also Golwachi, a lot of travel. And day five, we just went to Karaman, Marash, and in and around the city, a lot of observations. And day six, finally, last day, was Nurta, Osma, uh, Islahye, and Hassa. Here you can see the total route of our, our team uh, over the six days, almost traveling more than 3,200 kilometers and visiting almost uh, 125, 126 sites. These are the major locations visited, Karaman, Marash, Adiyaman, and the cities. And with this, I'd like to hand it over to Bora. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll be presenting the big picture of what we have seen uh, during our visit of six days in the um, earthquake affected region before we go into and start talking about the uh, system performance uh, and the uh, performance of uh, structural components, non-structural components, um, and uh, and other other types of buildings. So what we have done is we basically put together a database of um, all the sites uh, that we have visited. Uh, as uh, part mentioned earlier, we visited about 130 sites. Uh, with a total of about uh, 170 buildings uh, at those 130 sites. This is just a snapshot of our database uh, where we put the um, building information for each of the sites, uh, the type of uh, lateral force resisting systems, the location of the building, and the uh, PGA and PGV values and so on uh, from the three major earthquakes in, in this sequence. So, <clears throat> So this is some statistics uh, about the buildings we have seen. Uh, on the top left, you see here the different occupancy types. Most of the buildings we have seen were residential. About 75% of the buildings were residential buildings. Uh, in addition to these um, residential buildings, we have also seen some um, schools and universities, <clears throat> some industrial buildings, uh, six hospitals, uh, some historical buildings, government, government buildings, and commercial buildings, which were basically uh, some office buildings. On the right here in this pie chart, uh, what we have is the type of lateral force resisting system. As you can see, uh, most of the buildings uh, were uh, reinforced concrete uh, frames with shear walls. That accounted about 70% uh, of all the buildings we have seen, but in addition to these, uh, we have seen a small fraction of um, the unreinforced masonry buildings, some shear wall buildings, which we call here as the tunnel form construction, uh, some steel frame buildings, and uh, some reinforced concrete shear wall buildings with uh, steel gravity frames. There were a few base isolated buildings, and these were exclusively the hospitals. And then there were some uh, reinforced concrete moment resistant frames. On the bottom here uh, is a histogram of the PGAs and PGVs at these sites. As you can see on the left, uh, the distribution of the PGA, uh, most of the buildings have experienced uh, peak ground accelerations ranging from uh, 0.2 G to 0.7 G with a more or less uniform distribution. And uh, in, in terms of the PGV, 
um, uh, the PGV values were anywhere between 20 to 100, 110 uh, centimeters per second um, in the in those um, building sites. And as you can see here, uh, these are significant uh, ground motions um, at the sites uh, where we uh, visited. This is uh, another histogram of the uh, building heights. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we have seen most of the buildings we have seen were in the range of uh, six to 15 stories, which is uh, very typical of the region when it comes to residential construction. There were a smaller number of uh, buildings with uh, heights from one to five stories and um, uh, a few buildings which were higher than 15 stories. We did not see any buildings in the region uh, that were taller than uh, 20 stories. This is a uh, damage classification um, in uh, of the buildings uh, that we have seen. And to um, be clear, this is the damage classification that we have done. This is not the Turkish government's uh, damage classification. Most of the buildings, about 60%, uh, were heavily damaged and, uh, and then followed by moderate and moderate damage and partial collapse. A small fraction of the buildings we have seen were lightly damaged or not damaged at all. Obviously, the um, building sites we picked uh, were a little bit biased towards uh, more heavily damaged buildings, but uh, we made sure to pick some random buildings in each of the major cities that we have visited without uh, prior knowledge of uh, what the damage status was. These are um, damage descriptions, so the types of damage we have seen in these uh, about 160, 170 buildings. Diagonal cracking here is um, in, an indication of shear failure in, in structural components. Rebar buckling, um, is, um, is, as we know, can happen in, in, in a structural component pretty much in walls, uh, columns, uh, beams. We have seen some smaller fraction of rebar ruptures, um, a lot of concrete crushing, uh, which is kind of expected when it comes to uh, strong earthquakes like this one. Most of the concrete crushing we have seen were in the uh, compression pores of uh, shear walls and, and columns. We have seen some cracking in some of the uh, slabs uh, or diaphragms in buildings and uh, plastic hinging. We have seen a lot of plastic hinging, obviously, as most of these buildings we have seen were uh, combinations of moment frames with shear walls. To break this down a little bit further, uh, what we have seen is in terms of plastic hinging, obviously, you would ideally want your plastic hinges to be in the beams. Um, but we have seen a significant number of uh, plastic hinges also in the columns and some uh, combination of uh, beams and columns. In terms of uh, rebar bottling, uh, we have interestingly seen uh, several cases of uh, rebar bottling in the beams, which is kind of unexpected, uh, indicating the lack of confinement and transfer reinforcement. We have seen a significant number of uh, rebar buckling cases in the columns and the walls, and there were a few cases where uh, we have seen these in, in a combination of different uh, structural components. In terms of uh, diagonal cracking, again, this is an indication of shear failures. Uh, we have seen several cases in beams uh, or coupling beams uh, and, uh, and in the columns and, and as well as walls. So in terms of concrete crushing, uh, as I mentioned before, these mainly happen not in the core concrete, but in the compression pores of uh, walls and columns. You can see here they were more or less equally distributed between walls and columns, and there were a number of combined cases where we have seen both in the walls and as well as in the columns. Now I'll pass it on to Rupa. Uh, she's going to talk about the system behavior. Hi, um, my name is Rupa Drai. I want to make sure everybody can hear me. Yes, we can hear. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to focus a little bit more on the system behavior of the buildings that we have seen. And clearly the questions that arise in your mind is, were there design issues, were there construction issues, material issues, or implementing the design? Maybe we won't be able to answer all questions in 100%, but we can, by looking at what we found, hopefully it answers most of them to a satisfactory degree here. So first, uh, as Bora just mentioned, most of the buildings were reinforced concrete buildings. Um, 
there were reinforced concrete shear wall plus frame. Um, and this is the first type of buildings that we saw. And in this particular structure that you see, this, uh, this were, these were like four buildings that were under construction. Um, one of them was completely completed in the sense that the structure was completed, but um, you can see on the right bottom image that had completely collapsed. Second building, which had a permanent drift, a permanent set that you can see that's there behind that building. Uh, there was another building there where we, which was standing, we did not see a permanent drift, but we did see significant damage in that building in components level. And Halil will go through that in a more detailed manner, but we saw that we were able to see those. And then the fourth building was under construction. It was not completely loaded. It, it, had, it was only about eight to ten, eight stories in there. And so we saw that. But one thing that stuck in mind in this particular building is that we had the plan of this particular building. And what you can see is that the shear wall system was along the partition wall. And in the transverse direction, we had perhaps enough shear wall, but in the longitudinal direction, we just had one line of shear wall, perhaps which was not sufficient for this building to withstand it, which were, and hence a torsion failure, a significant, a complete collapse. Next, uh, I can do it. Sorry. Um, then, Looking at the similar kind of structure, we did look into buildings in this particular area where uh, there were about 16 buildings in this location. One had completely collapsed, not one, but two of them had completely collapsed. In the Google Earth, you can actually see, if you can see my mouse in here, there was this building that has collapsed and it's uh, shown in the image in here. And there was another significant building that was uh, damaged considerably. And what we saw in these buildings when we looked into it is that these showed brittle failure. They were not ductile. Designers, as we know, as engineers, we know that we want to build a building that's more ductile. Um, and then next question is, we wonder you know, what the issues are, right? And in this case, there were, this, uh, these are, this is a um, location, this is a site in Malatya which did see a um, good amount of ground motion, but not perhaps significant enough as Antakya. And for comparison, there were two buildings located in the site, exactly the same design, constructed at the same time, designed by the same, same, same firm, and then at the same time was constructed by the same firm. And these two buildings also saw a different behavior. And clearly, it was designed to 2007 code, which is a new code, uh, which does, which is comparable to our AAC 716 code. And you can see that on the building on the left, if you can see in here, it had a partial collapse. And this building was, when we looked into it carefully, we found that it did not have infill walls at the perimeter or within this building because it was a parking structure underneath that building that at level one. Whereas on the other side, on the right, you can see that there were infill walls located in this regions. And perhaps this added a bit of a stiffness, not, it's perhaps not the right thing to do, but somehow, it helped the building to not completely collapse in this case. It leads to a question whether infill walls are, whether how we should be designing this infill walls. Next. Um, for this, in this case, um, this is a famous 12-year-old uh, building. It's a resonance uh, apartment complex in Ant Antakya, very slender building had very minimal shear walls in this transverse direction. But what we saw in this particular, uh, uh, what this building's faced is a complete collapse. There was in fact, um, ductile, uh, in, there was complete brittle failure. You can see the tension um, uh, in, in the lap splices of the concrete uh, and it com the, the columns, the lower columns had completely separated out, have pulled up from the 
foundation. Unlike the systems that we had seen, which were designed in the United States, this parking structure in the when it saw the 1994 Northridge earthquake, it had a complete ductile failure. Uh, it it had collapsed uh, as well, but the failure was ductile, and perhaps that's what we are designing, what we are aiming to design for. And. Um, this just bringing this particular uh, building had seen about 750 people had died. It was a big source of news in the New York Times as well. Um, many in in here, uh, Bora Inclusive was a part of uh, the forensic that is being done for this building. So, nevertheless, this one clearly is something. The designing uh, buildings like this is something that we need to avoid. Um, then talking about similar kind of buildings, but this is a, again a complex of 37 buildings, which uh, was a, in this particular region. But what happened in here is we saw significant um, peeling, we saw significant damage in the shear walls, in the columns, also in the link beams. And all the buildings were standing, but when we visited there, we were not able to even we were not it, not everybody is allowed to get into this building but what we heard that all these buildings because of its heavy damage were to be brought down so there is this mass demolition that will have to be done for these buildings and you can imagine that this is what we are up against as part said 230000 buildings are were either collapsed or are going to be brought down um now going to another segment of concrete buildings, which is the tunnel form of construction that is typically used in Turkey. And most of the government agencies and low cost housing is actually uh, uses this form of construction. And what we see in this particular buildings or what we have noticed is minimal damage. And questions arise, why so? And perhaps we cannot comment on the rebar detailing of this building because we were not able to see them clearly. But one thing for sure is that these buildings had a lot more shear walls. About 3% of the floor area was covered with shear walls. Having said that, perhaps this offered redundancy to these buildings, which made them see less damage. Although it was not zero in these buildings as well, what we saw is evidence of short column failure. The earthquakes were able to find these locations and we potentially, we did see significant damage on these areas. Um, also in this particular building, which was a high rise, but we saw bottom hinging that occurred on the shear wall in this place as well. Going to the next segment of um, you know systems, which is the steel framed building. One which is we want to show you this these buildings in Iskenderan. Uh, on the left is an image of three steel buildings, steel framed buildings, um, beautifully designed, and it had not seen any damage at all. The irony is that um, because they were steel buildings, it was so expensive. The contractor. Uh, it seemed had run out of business. So was so were the designers, and these buildings were mostly empty when the earthquake occurred. But these were the buildings that were not damaged. Uh, on the right is another steel building of similar example where uh, you we had we had seen very we had seen minimum we had seen absolutely or I would say almost close to zero damage. Um. Again, there were not too many residential buildings, but this is uh, residential steel buildings, I would say. Uh, this is one example of a steel building which had seen significant damage. And this building, as you can see, you, 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 if you look at the global picture on the left, there is a catenary action that was significant. And that had occurred because of a column, and I'm pointing to the image uh, right top. It was a column that was um, anchored to a basement wall and so the anchorage had sheared off and the connection had sheared off, which led to this column slipping off the basement wall. And a result of it, 
uh, there was a complete tipping effect and that that's the reason why it had caused that catenary action. Clearly the building has seen significant damage and it will have to be brought down. But this was one of the predominant steel building uh, failure that we had seen in there. Another case uh, was in regards to some vertical irregularities. Now, in Turkey, we understand that the planning commission allows for building a higher footprint at level two and above. But at the lower floor, there is a desire to have the structural system to a smaller footprint, to enclose, have the enclosure in a smaller footprint. What means is that we have vertical irregularities. We don't have the shear wall and the columns at the perimeter go all the way down. In some cases, they are supported by cantilever beams. And what we saw in them is significant damage because they were not designed to appropriate level with proper redundancy factor. And clearly there were more images where you can see these can these significant damages that were noted in these beams, in these cantilever beams that were supporting the above floors. Um, global behavior, we did see pounding effects. A lot of buildings were built just next to each other. And in some cases you see the middle image where the diaphragm of the two different buildings were not even aligned. And what it resulted in is significant pounding effects to a point where some of the buildings had actually literally collapsed because of pounding effects. Important to note that, um, or at, in, in here was, uh, the, this is the last thing that I wanted to cover in terms of global behavior uh, is the settlement and the overturning issues. In regions in Iskandran, we had seen a complete settlement of the buildings, about five story, and we had seen about 18 inch of complete uh, uh, settlement. But in this location, which we are uh, showing the pictures on the top as well, uh, the bottom left images, they were from this region called Golbasi, which had seen significant amount of overturning due to liquefaction issues. And uh, on the top images is the same building, uh, which had literally seen no damage, except that the foundation had tilted over and it bumped into another building. Um, Clearly, the foundation system had to be designed with piles or something more robust to encompass for this liquid action issues. And then not only this, not only the buildings at the top, in line with this building were uh, a series of buildings which had seen significant overturning. Clearly, they will have to be brought down, but um, that's something uh, that they will be working towards. And with that, I will hand it over to Halil for going over the component level uh, behavior. Uh, yes. Uh, I need to go one slide back. And for some reason, I can't. I will be talking about... Um, Floor slabs uh, and all the components. Okay, perfect. In a reinforced concrete building, uh, uh, this is one of the floor or slab types that uh, that is quite common in Turkey, where there are joists and then um, the the voids between the joists are filled in with either bricks or lightweight uh, masonry blocks, as you can see on the. Uh, top pictures, and if you look at the high-rise building near the bottom uh, right corner, you can see those square uh, joists, and then you can see those um, masonry blocks uh, filling in in that cantilever type uh, extensions. And then Rupa did a good job of uh, drawing a cross section of how the floor slab uh, uh, looks like. Okay, for some reason I'm having trouble here. Uh, the one, can you help me out? Uh, next slide. Okay, perfect. So these um, floor systems are so strong and rigid that it is almost uh, impossible to have damage in them. So that results in 
uh, much stronger slab or beam behavior. So as a result, uh, the damage is pushed into the columns, as you can see in these examples. So um, uh, the result of this is we are kind of violating strong column weak beam behavior that is desirable in uh, seismic regions. So, and also we are pushing uh, most of the deformations into the columns rather than, uh, rather than uh, uh, beams. Wow, I'm having trouble here. Uh, uh, next slide, the one if you can help me out. Thank you. So this is one of the rare cases where uh, Lord's lab failed with this type of system. Now we can see how it looks like uh, uh, as a result of um, a building next to it hitting this uh, building as a result of impact. But even then, we don't see that collapse uh, uh, completely happening, and it looks uh, quite uh, ductile. So this is one system that uh, needs to be something done about in Turkey. I believe uh, they have uh, some restrictions at this point uh, about these um, uh, about these slab systems. Uh, next, please. Uh, as far as the beams are concerned, um, uh, typically we observe much less damage in beams compared to vertical load carrying um, system or elements like uh, columns and shear walls. But uh, uh, regardless, we saw quite a bit of damage and typically at the ends of the beams, uh, like the one that you see near the near the top where plastic hinges are either developing or starting to develop. And the, the, the bottom one is also a very typical one that we see uh, damage happening um, uh, near the uh, near the ends of the near the ends of the the beams. Okay, next please. Uh, you can see two different types of uh, damage in the beams in this. Um, slide in the top uh, uh clearly the the beams are trying to develop uh, plastic hinges at their ends uh, unfortunately due to either lack of uh, transfer steel or minimum amount of transfer steel in many cases we see those uh, the damage that uh, you see at the top where energy dissipation is either very limited or we cannot they cannot develop uh, full plastic hinges well, at the other end of the spectrum, we have seen some buildings where the beams were detailed and uh, reinforced quite well. And uh, we just copied a couple examples near the bottom of uh, this slide. Uh, next. Uh, there were quite a bit of uh, short beams or coupling beams and deep beams uh, in the area that we have seen several of those. The top one is a very good, uh, interesting example as Rupa, um, described, there were quite a bit of uh, tunnel form uh, shear wall buildings. Uh, at first, uh, we thought they were all done by government. It turns out there are some private contractors. They also do uh, complete shear wall or uh, tunnel form buildings, like the one that you see on the screen near the top uh, in Marash. This was a building complex or development with, I believe, at least uh, five or six buildings, like the one that you see uh, on the screen. So when they have this uh, shear wall, complete shear wall or tunnel system, they need to have the openings, right, for the doors and windows. So the, the two pictures near the top uh, left are uh, deep beams or coupling beams between the shear walls. It is interesting that this building had almost no damage in the shear walls or the load carrying system, but in the lower four or five st uh, stories, uh, most of the uh, coupling beams or deep beams had the uh, diagonal cracks like the one uh, we show, uh, you see on the screen. And there were quite a bit of other examples. Anytime we had uh, short or uh, deep beams, we had the damage uh, like the one that is shown near the uh, bottom of the screen. I need uh, with the next slide again. Uh, beam column joints uh, had uh, had issues with the uh, transfer steel and confinement. Uh, again, uh, the damage to beam column joints were uh, much less compared to columns or walls in general, but uh, we have observed quite a bit of damage like the ones that you see on the screen. Uh, in almost all cases, the transfer steel uh, was uh, uh, either lacking or not, um, uh, not um, uh, enough to sufficiently confine the beam column uh, joint region. If we go to the next slide, uh, uh, the, the, the figure that, uh, if we go one back, please. Uh, another unusual thing we observed in the field is uh, 
uh, there were a lot of uh, rebar fractures, like the one that is shown inside that red um, circle or uh, ellipse, where I'm not sure whether you can see those longitudinal bars. They were fractured. So that was a little bit unexpected, uh, given the level of damage at other locations. And this wasn't an isolated case. There in, uh, in many cases, we have uh, seen that, that uh, uh, Turkish authorities may want to investigate uh, why uh, there were so many uh, bar fractures were happening in the field. That was a little bit uh, unusual uh, that we observed in the field. And there were many cases where uh, transfer steel was uh, meeting, um, missing either in the foundation to column joints or beam to column joints that we are talking about right now. Uh, next, please. Okay, so columns are the major components that... Uh, uh, that suffered damage and as a result, either partial or complete, complete collapse of uh, buildings happened. Uh, I just copied the 2007 Turkish seismic code where uh, the codes are very well written and um, uh, explain the, the detailed requirements as you see on the screen where the transfer steel uh, uh, spacing or column tie spacing is supposed to be less than uh, 10 centimeters in the plastic hinge regions at the top and bottom. And then 135 uh, degree tie hooks are required along the height of the column and cross ties are required if there are uh, multiple or more than four uh, longitudinal bars. And there were a few cases where we observed these detailing and those members uh, responded uh, quite uh, as expected, as you can see in the uh, uh, in the slide near the bottom uh, left corner. But in many, many cases, these uh, detailing requirements were not uh, uh, seen in the, or not applied in the, uh, in the field. Uh, next, please. Uh, so when, um, when those uh, detailing requirements are not applied, uh, in other words, in these examples, uh, we rarely see uh, cross ties or overlapping ties. And then uh, typically we don't see those 135 degree hooks. Uh, one major, in addition to those, one major problem was the splices that uh, they either come from the lower stories or from the foundation, as you see in these examples. And then uh, three feet, uh, uh, maybe half a meter above the foundational or slab level, they are cut. And then the, um, those lab splices created huge problems. So I've been to some earthquake and reconnaissance uh, efforts that I've never seen so many column failure or uh, column failures or building failures as a result of uh, longitudinal bar lap splices. Uh, so as a result of those uh, damage initiation, as you can see in these examples, shear failure happened and those were uh, obviously brittle uh, failures and that led to major damage in uh, buildings. Uh, next slide, please. Another major problem was the axial loads in columns tended to be quite uh, large. As again, Rupa explained, in many cases in Turkey, uh, the floor area in the second floor and up uh, tends to be larger compared to the first or ground level. As you can see on the uh, on the right-hand side, uh, during the earthquake, especially under bidirectional loading, the corner column tends to receive much larger axial loads. And the gravity loads are already large in those uh, in those columns. If we look at the total axial load, and we can roughly estimate what the axial load is, and they are already uh, maybe at uh, thirty percent, twenty percent. And then during the earthquake, those axial loads clearly moved up much larger. That's the reason there were more uh, failures observed in corner columns uh, than the other columns. So I just put a. Uh, axial load moment interaction diagram represent representation there, where even if you even if the columns are detailed in a very ductile manner, as soon as you move up the balance point, uh, the failure happens and it needs to happen by concrete crushing in a brittle manner. So that was a major issue. There is another example on the right-hand side, or sorry, left-hand side, where you can see the other corner of the building. Um, with the columns shown in dashed uh, circle or ellipse versus uh, during the earthquake, uh, uh, two uh, columns were lost uh, in two levels. And there were countless examples of these type of failures uh, uh, in the field. Uh, next, please. 
another issue that we have seen is um, there were a lot of uh, failures uh, for the columns and also shear walls in the weak direction. I think one reason for this is uh, engineers and also computer software, they account for the stiffness and rigidity or strength of the columns in the weak direction. Although uh, there's a little bit of strength and stiffness, uh, it will be a good idea to ignore them. That uh, tends to create issues uh, because at the system level, if you have too many of these columns in the weak direction, when you add up uh, their stiffness and strength, that gives you quite a bit of strength, but uh, during the earthquake, they tend to fail uh, one after other because uh, obviously that's the weak uh, direction. Uh, next, please. Okay, uh, one good news is short columns were much rare and unusual than uh, one would expect uh, in a very large earthquake like this one. So we rarely saw short columns uh, in the field. That was That's very good news for the practice uh, in Turkey. Um, uh, the, even the one that we see on the screen on the right-hand side, uh, it is not really the uh, actual short column itself. It is a short column that is created because of failure of the infill wall. And uh, uh, one unfortunate incident uh, was in Malatya on the left-hand side that high-rise building was still under construction, uh, but uh, because of... Um, Again, partial infill, uh, all the columns in the first uh, floor level had short column effect and they had damage. Luckily, the demand was not large enough to push this building into uh, collapse level. Uh, next, please. Uh, shear walls save buildings. So that's what we learned. Uh, anytime you have shear walls, even if they are very limited uh, in terms of their numbers and uh, amount of uh, area, they were extremely helpful uh, in resisting the lateral uh, forces. If you look at the two shear walls on the uh, on the right hand side, they are beaten up uh, in both directions, especially the green one. Uh, and then in that building, there were four or five uh, columns. They were completely gone, yet this four or five store building was still uh, standing. So shear walls were very effective, and luckily in many buildings, they had shear walls either around the stairwells or elevator shafts, and they, uh, they uh, ended up saving uh, many buildings in the, in, the, in the field. That's a lesson learned that uh, the amount and the, and the number of shear walls should be increased as much as possible uh, in uh, frame buildings, if at all possible. Uh, next slide, please. And the last component that I will uh, touch upon is foundations. Uh, if you look at them as structural components, they performed extremely well. And we spent uh, some time in Iskenderun and um, uh, Gölbaşı where soil failures and liquefaction were highly pronounced uh, and they were quite uh, uh, effective on the overall building response. But uh, even in those case cases, foundations did relatively or quite well, and we did not see any uh, structural collapse or damage as a result of foundation failures or maybe a relative settlement. Uh, this is one picture from Iskenderun where uh, the, there were quite a bit of liquefaction and soil failures in this area, and the building uh, sunk in for about um, 30 centimeters, yet there was almost no damage uh, uh, in that building. And again, uh, foundations did uh, quite well in this Earthquake. So I'm going to let Morgan take over and look at other types of structures. Great. Thank you. Hello. Um, let me just make sure I've got control here. Good. Okay. Uh, again, thank you everyone for joining. I know there's people all over, many people in Turkey, and it, it's great to have you on. We appreciate it. Um, as Halil and Rupa were just discussing, and as Bora pointed out early on, uh, the real, I think, star here in terms of building type that people focused on for, for good reason um, was reinforced concrete frame buildings with and without shear walls. And as Halil just mentioned, sometimes those shear walls were quite minimal. And so some of the, the building types classified on this slide on the right here as reinforced concrete frame with shear walls did have minimal shear walls, but, but there were some there. So a lot of the lessons that have been learned from our team, from other reconnaissance efforts in the region, uh, those lessons have been largely related to the performance of these types of structures and uh, what might be done differently moving forward 
to get better performance in future earthquakes. We also, as a team though, tried to focus on other building types as well as other building occupancies. So many of these multi-story reinforced concrete frame buildings that we looked at were residential as shown on the slide on the left, perhaps with some commercial or office space on the ground floor. Uh, but for the most part, the majority of those buildings were residential. So we also tried to look at the trends in performance of other occupancy types. We looked, as you can see, at school buildings, hospitals, government buildings, et cetera. And so I'm gonna spend just a couple of minutes here uh, focusing on a few different types of structural systems we saw, uh, the patterns of performance at those buildings, as well as some general comments about uh, occupancy category uh, and patterns of damage that we saw uh, of, of various occupancy types. So there is unreinforced masonry, of course, uh, in Turkey. And that type of construction tends to occur in historic areas. The photographs I'm showing you here are before and after in a historic region, region of Antakya. So this is uh, a location near the river. It's a location that uh, had a lot of damage from an earthquake back in 1872. And there was a lot of rebuilding of um, structures in this area shortly after that earthquake, including a very prominent uh, church that's uh, very close to where these buildings are located. And so in terms of construction dates that we could find on some of these buildings online, um, many of them were around the early 1900s, probably around that time of rebuilding after a, a prior earthquake. And the performance of unreinforced masonry was, I would say, about what we would expect as structural engineers. So this is, of course, a type of construction that uh, other reconnaissance efforts and previous earthquakes uh, have found it does quite poorly oftentimes in earthquakes and certainly in regions of strong ground shaking like was experienced here in Antakya. Uh, we see some of the characteristic patterns of damage to wall piers. In the lower left, this is a hotel building. The remaining walls, we see large uh, X pattern cracks in the piers. And then we see detachment of the tops of those walls from the, the roof diaphragm. And in some cases that led to a collapse. So uh, the building on the right, it was a two-story building. We had detachment of the uh, URM wall piers from the roof in that structure, and that second story collapsed onto the first story below, as you see in the lower right photograph. So I would say that overall, in terms of uh, unreinforced masonry construction, uh, this earthquake really was probably lessons relearned. Um, we saw some of the similar poor performance in unreinforced masonry that we've seen in past earthquakes. Another example of an unreinforced masonry building in the downtown area of Antakya. This was very close to that historic Greek Orthodox church that suffered a lot of damage if you followed the, the, the damage patterns in this area. And again, two stories, uh, the top story collapsed on the bottom story, some interesting arch type construction at the first story there in this building you see in the lower right photograph. And um, we didn't get collapse of that first story but we had fairly complete collapse of the second story on top of that. Let's contrast that now. So uh, we looked as a team at three hospital buildings. As you most, most of you know, there was a separate hospitals team. So we were not focused on the, uh, the aspects of hospital operation that that group was focused on, but we did look at three of the structures as uh, a bit of a contrast to what we saw in some of the um, reinforced concrete frame type buildings and certainly the URM type buildings around it. These were three base isolated structures. One was under construction on the left here, um, a good opportunity to be able to look at those isolator components. Um, some of the hospital was constructed as you see in the upper left. And so uh, we actually got to see what the displacement, residual displacement was at these isolators. Um, the hospital on the right, is a building that we looked at in Malatya. And again, in contrast to even some of the reinforced concrete health facilities in the area that did not perform well, um, this hospital was, was operational when we were there, uh, not without damage. If you look at the lower right photograph, I'm down here, uh, we're down here in the, uh, the basement of this hospital. And uh, you can see the isolator on top of the, the concrete column in the left-hand side of that photograph, but there still was some damage to the uh, partition wall 
in the foreground of the photograph where the door was. So again, not, not damage free, but certainly much better performance than um, some of the reinforced concrete frame structures that were in very close proximity to this hospital. Uh, school and government buildings. These are not structural systems. These are occupancy categories. Uh, and so obviously the performance of these buildings depended very much on the particular structural system. Some of the trends that we saw were uh, oftentimes these buildings lack the wide open ground floor with, with a taller story perhaps that we saw in a lot of the reinforced concrete frame buildings. And as a re result of that, uh, we often saw damage to these buildings, but not to the level of collapse or partial collapse that we saw in many of the reinforced concrete frame buildings that uh, Halil and Rupa just showed us photographs of. Um, the photograph in the lower right is a bit of a, a unique case. This is a technical university in Iskenderun uh, that had sky bridges connecting various buildings on campus. And, and those sky bridges were not uh, connected robustly. And uh, therefore, either the shaking or the relative movement between the buildings led to failure of some of those connections and some of the collapses that we see here. Another interesting case at that school, there was um, some liquefaction that occurred. And uh, you could see evidence of that on the ground outside of one of the classrooms. And um, it, perhaps ironically, uh, one of those classrooms that had that liquefaction evidence outside of it was a, a geotechnical engineering laboratory. So think about that geotechnical engineering laboratory with evidence of liquefaction right outside that building. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'll just say a little bit about religious buildings. Uh, so as an occupancy category, we looked at churches and mosques. Um, these buildings, the performance of these buildings was, of course, highly dependent on the structural system. Many of them, if they were older, were of URM construction. And in the lower right photograph, you see some damage to URM at, uh, at a mosque structure. Uh, in the upper left, this was a reinforced concrete structure not too far from Antakya. And some of the patterns that we saw in damage to religious buildings was they tended to have large open spaces. That's common, of course, for religious structures. And in those areas, there was a lack of redundancy and, uh, and, and therefore um, a lot of issues with collapse where there weren't adjacent elements to help share the loads. There also are, of course, decorative elements, domes, minarets, other features, on these buildings that, um, again, if not detailed properly, we saw a lot of uh, damage and collapse to those, those types of elements. One last one before I pass it off to Mike. Um, we looked at, uh, as an occupancy category, industrial buildings. Again, a big variety of structural systems that determine behavior. What I wanna point out on the right here, this is a precast concrete industrial warehouse, um, uh, connections that were not robust, that, that were adequate for gravity loading, everyday loading of the buildings. Um, but those connections typically consisted of a small depression in a corbel or perhaps a girder um, with a fairly short embedded steel dowel that provided the connection. Those connections weren't robust for lateral loading. And we saw um, some complete collapse of roof structures like we're looking at here on the right. And so with that, Mike, I'll turn it over to you to, uh, to take us from here. Great, thanks so much, Morgan. Um, hi everyone, my name is Mike Mueller and I'm gonna close out our presentation today with a discussion of some of the damage that we observed to non-structural components, which will help um, provide a more complete picture of what we, we saw in the field um, back in March. And then I'll, I'll close with a, a quick discussion of next steps for our team, and then we can begin the, the live Q&A. So just a quick reminder, if you have questions, feel free to drop those in the chat, but we'll also save some time at the end um, for some live question and answer. Um, so let me just see if I've got control here real quick. Um, I don't think it's, okay, yeah, maybe I'll just ask to advance the slide, Devin, if you can do that. Um, so I wanted to start with um, some damage that we observed to facades. Um, so uh, most commonly, especially in residential buildings, um, facades are typically unreinforced masonry infill walls covered with a layer of insulation and then a waterproof membrane. Um, so these wall, the infill walls are, are typically um, either concrete masonry unit 
blocks, which are shown there on the upper um, right photo on the left-hand side, or um, a hollow clay tile bricks. Um, and, and so we'll frequently see a combination of these two uh, materials in, in the infill walls that, that we observed in the field. Um, these walls, it's important to note, are not structural, as Eduardo uh, mentioned in one of the, the questions that was asked in the chat. Um, they're not tied to the, the, uh, the concrete frames or, or, or walls uh, uh, that adjacent to these elements, um, but they are very stiff and relatively strong, so they do participate in resisting lateral loads, initially at least, but have very low deformation capacity, so we'll start to start to see them crack at relatively low interstory drift ratios, and we'll, we'll tend to see damage concentrated at lower floors of buildings where the drifts are the highest. So the other two pictures on this slide um, show kind of the progression of, oops, sorry, can you go back to the, the previous slide? So those, the, the, the picture on the left shows kind of the initiation of damage where you start to, to get delamination of, of um, the uh, insulation layer and, and waterproof membrane. And then um, on the right-hand side on the bottom, you see the kind of traditional diagonal cracking in the, the infill walls representing, you know, more significant demand on that wall. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Um, and here we see more examples of uh, even more severe damage to infill walls. On the left, um, we have complete failure and collapse of, of infill walls near the base of the building. Um, in the middle, we have um, uh, potential higher mode effects um, visible in, in the infill walls as, as damage is distributed um, you know, throughout the height of, of that structure. And then on the right-hand side, uh, the, the, that image captures some of the more um, significant or dire consequences of infill damage um, to facades, where we have complete, um, again, complete collapse failure of, of those walls, and this time impacting, this is at a hospital, impacting the ambulance parked outside, and obviously can't use that vehicle, and I believe this also knocked out the power feed to the, the building. So. Um, you know, these walls, you know, while not detailed to um, be part of the structure, obviously go along for the ride and are damaged and, and can generate um, both life safety impacts as well as functional rec recovery impacts. So next slide, please. Another uh, facade system that we saw um, mostly in commercial buildings uh, was storefront glazing. Um, and so these typically comprise of glass panels uh, set within metal frames that then span um, the gaps between structural elements. And so the photos on this slide uh, here capture the spectrum of damage that we observed um, from individual glass panels popping out on the top left to more significant damage to the, the, the metal frames itself from the top right, and even some, some global buckling um, probably caused by, by loss of volume um, in structural elements um, in those, those more damaged buildings. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so infill walls were also used uh, commonly as interior partitions in most buildings, especially residential buildings. Um, and so the, the photos here capture some of the, the more significant failures we saw uh, take place in, in some residential buildings we were able to gain access to. Um, the image on the left shows a collapse onto a, a, a child's bed, so obviously highlighting the um, life safety concerns um, that these walls pose. Um, and and uh, also, you know, it, in addition to that, that life safety concern, even in buildings where, you know, maybe the, the damage to infill walls was, was limited to, you know, moderate cracking and not necessarily out of plane failures, that still gives off to, to non-engineers the perception of a more significantly damaged building than, than it might otherwise be considered if, if you know, you know, just to look at the, the structural members and, and, and observe the damage there. So often a lot of these residential buildings, even if they were lightly damaged, um, were not occupied and you know people were just afraid to go back in them given the the cracking observed in these in these infill walls uh, next slide please um another type of interior partition we observed although not very commonly was um steel frame partitions with drywall panels like we typically use in the u.s in commercial facilities um this maybe isn't the greatest example because this building had pretty significant structural issues but um what we saw here at least was was buckling of the steel frame pop out of, of the panels themselves. But this is driven by you know, loss of volume and, and uh, structural damage um, throughout the facility that, that 
cause these issues within these walls. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, moving, switching gears a little bit to, to ceilings, specifically suspended ceilings. Um, these, again, weren't common to residential buildings and were more typical in, in commercial and healthcare facilities. Um, I just wanted to, to quickly run through the, the spectrum of damage states that we observed um, from isolated failure of, of HVAC ducts and, and vents in, in the suspended ceilings as shown on the left, which, and those elements typically lacked seismic restraint to, um, you know, initiation or, or kind of separation of the, the uh, suspended ceiling frame from, from the structural uh, wall um, or the, the wall member attachment point on the right hand side on the image on the right. And then if you go to the next slide, we'll see um, some more dramatic uh, examples, failures um, of, of suspended ceilings um, completely collapsing um, and crashing down to the ground below. Um, and again, um, you know, if you can see the details on, on these pictures, uh, a lot of these systems lacked seismic restraint. So I guess not terribly surprising that they came down, um, but obviously a life safety concern and a, a functional recovery concern um, for these buildings. Next slide, please. Uh, we observed a lot of damage to rooftop equipment, um, specifically uh, solar hot water heaters, which um, typically involved a, a large water tank uh, supported on a, a rather uh, thin um, steel uh, frame structure. And so, you know, when these are the tops of, of roofs, um, you'll see, you know, high accelerations and, and that, all that mass um, just causes collapse of, of those, those solar water heaters and they either, you know, crash onto the ground or, or um, fail in, in, in place and hit the roof. Um, we also observed um, the, the image on the bottom, uh, it's kind of hard to make out, but the, the building in the back um, used to have a wood framed a gable roof um, with uh, heavy clay tile. And so the, the, um, the roof structure, the wood roof structure had collapsed due to the, the, um, the weight of the, uh, and, and uh, the inertial load of the, the heavy uh, clay tile on that building. And so we saw this, this is a school building, but we also saw that um, throughout some residential towers as well. Next slide, please. Um, so just getting quickly into, into uh, damage to contents, um, the images here show some, some photos uh, from uh, residential buildings. And um, there's obviously an interplay here between the, the infill walls, which, which um, are shown as, as having collapsed here, but the, the uh, photo on the right shows a, a cabinet that appears to have um, pulled out from, from the wall it was attached to. And so if you go to the next slide, we'll see some, some additional examples of, of um, shelving, toppling, computers toppling, books coming off of shelves. Um, and, and again, just kind of representing, you know, like a, giving a glimpse of what, you know, the, the people in these structures experienced in, in you know, probably in, in, you know, darkness, the first earthquake was in the middle of the night, um, trying to, 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 you know, safely uh, leave these buildings um, was incredibly challenging due to all the, the, the damage. Next slide, please. Um, here's a, a interesting modular uh, backup water tank that we saw in a school um, that had, had uh, uh, been damaged in the earthquake kind of at the, the mid height of, of the, the tank itself. Um, not exactly sure what, what the failure mode was here, but, but likely sloshing of some kind uh, or maybe poor, poor detailing. Um, yeah, we, we haven't really dug into this one uh, in, in, in a good amount of detail, but this, this tank was rendered inoperable um, as a result of the damage. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I think that the last element, um, uh, so, so we, we did document damage to, to stairwells, um, concrete cast in place stairwells were, were the, you know, what we most commonly saw in the field. And I wanted to echo an, an observation made in last week's webinar by the hospitals team, where um, we tended to see the, you know, the most damage to, to these concrete stairwells um, when they were uh, surrounded by infill walls rather than concrete shear walls, meaning that they, they actually picked up a good amount of the load in the structure through strut action. And that caused you know, a lot of the, the more um, severe damage observations that we, we witnessed. In addition to, as you can see in these two pictures, um, the, the infill walls then collapsing into the stairwells 
and, and creating even additional, uh, even more challenges with, with egress in the building. Okay, next slide. Um, so that, yeah, that kind of wraps our, our observations um, from, from our trip um, back in March. And, and I wanted to briefly touch on some, some next steps that we have planned for our team before we open it up to a question and answer session. Um, so we're currently working on several detailed case studies um, for a handful of, of buildings that we observed during our trip. And, and the intent of these case studies would be to help us dig into some of the failure modes um, um, that we've we've been um, presenting in this in in our in this webinar, and, and maybe even help us explain um, you know the performance of of, of of buildings that did well. Um, so on the screen here, uh, I forget the city. I think this might have been Moresh, um, near Central Moresh. Um, we have you know like a block or two of of buildings that 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 collapsed. Um, at, Pretty spectacularly, but then if you kind of turn around and 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 kind of look up the hill, just yeah, across the street, literally, um, there's a, a building that you know essentially from the outside at least looked like it had very very little damage, um, and and I believe Rupa uh, uh, entered this building and and we determined it was a government facility, um, and so uh, these case studies would be opportunities for us to not only understand why the buildings that perform poorly perform poorly, but also why buildings that, we also want to understand why buildings that potentially experience significant shaking, you know, perform well um, and, and definitely highlight those lessons learned from, from you know, good, good performance, not just bad performance. Um, so next slide. Um, and then some additional next steps. Um, we, we have some additional data analysis uh, on the, the, the buildings database that, um, Bora presented, um, including um, additional categorization of damage and, and, and non-structural damage, and then importantly, correlation of those, those damage levels with the shaking intensities that we've provi been provided by the gear team. Um, and, and that will go and, and help us inform our, our, our detailed case studies. Um, we also have several um, members of our team planning to visit Turkey again which will give us an opportunity to fill any gaps in the data that we collected and also dig in deeper into those case study buildings. And then I've also been talking with several members of the EERI Hausner's Fellows cohort and their um, project team project focuses on functional recovery. And they're specifically interested in um, getting a better understanding of what types of observations and data we need to be recording after earthquakes to help us validate um, you know, our, our downtime models for, for um, predicting um, impacts to buildings in terms of loss of use and, and duration of, of downtime, and also to, to help us um, hone, you know, future code requirements um, for, for uh, structural as well as non-structural elements. Um, we also have several upcoming conference presentations as shown on the screen. And then lastly, we are planning to submit um, a journal paper for the the special collection on the Turkey earthquake and earthquake spectra. Um, and then the last slide, I believe, um, just wanted to close um, with, uh, you go to the next slide, with uh, some acknowledgments, especially of all of our Turkish colleagues um, who helped uh, guide us uh, throughout the, the, the our duration of our trip um, and the many cities we visited, as well as the FOD who helped us gain access to sites that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to gain access to. Um, another shout out to, to the GEAR team um, and John Stewart uh, for providing uh, shaking intensity data that we're, we're starting to dig into, um, as well as Professor uh, Mustafa Erdik um, for some conversations we've had with him. And lastly, the other EERI teams that were in the field at the same time that we were, um, we, we you know coordinated plans and, and um, observations and, and we and they shared invaluable insights with us. So I just wanted to acknowledge all the great work um, supporting our, our team while we were in the field. And so with that, I think I'll close it and we can, I'll pass it off to, I believe, um, Elizabeth again. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation by, by everyone. Um, I want to reiterate uh, what Mike just mentioned to thank our friends and colleagues over at Turkey that were uh, great assistance, not only to this team, but all seven teams 
from ERI and GEAR, and this would have not been possible without their assistance before, during, and after uh, we were there. Uh, I will start out now the, um, the live uh, questions and answers. We have tried to, to answer many, about 50 questions we have answered already, but we have a few more minutes in, and I will read some of them. Uh, there's a question by David Freeman who, who wrote, excellent presentation. Does the report include learnings recommendations from Turkey, but also for the US? Given that the team focused on newer buildings, I'm wondering about the lessons learned that will be useful for efforts in San Francisco to create an ordinance for non-ductile concrete buildings. I think I put a response uh, response for that one uh, on my end. Uh, I'm sure Turkish authorities are looking into ways to increase shear walls. There may be some requirements depending on the height of the building. Another aspect is I think the column axial loads uh, and then splices. Those are the ones that I saw may uh, you know they may need to work on and uh, look into it. Thank you, Halil. If I may add, the, the report does include some recommendations, but they're mainly geared toward uh, additional reconnaissance. Um, but as Mike uh, mentioned, uh, there's a lot of ongoing work and, and, and some of that will be reflected in, in the special collection of earthquake spectra. And, and with that, I want to take the opportunity to invite everyone who's, who's working and conducting some research on these earthquakes to, to look at that call for, for papers in the Earthquake Spectra website and to contribute to it. There, there are some uh, colleagues from ITU, uh, from, from uh, ITU, MITU, uh, Bogadishi that, that are helping us in, in putting that special collection. Uh, specifically for San Francisco, uh, we often think of that we don't have masonry infills in the US, but if you actually look closely and walk around uh, downtown San Francisco, you will actually see quite a bit. And, and it's, it's something that we've not really addressed. We, we primarily consider the structure and so on, but there's certainly a, a big danger uh, from those even here in California. Uh, a, a general question that several people asked was if, if most of the observed damage was related to uh, non-compliance with the uh, building codes, or if there were some uh, damage related to, to structures that seem to follow the code fairly well. So, Professor Miranda, can I can I uh, sure add go to, ahead, Rupa? To, can I add to the response in here. I uh, clearly we haven't we have to still go over a few more case studies. But then there are things that we observed and uh, we want to think over. Some things like the strong column we could or check for wider beams. Is how wide is wide of a beam? And if that needs to be revisited for that one, because we did see significant column hinging that occurred under the Asmolan slab foundation, which was a result of the wider beams. And we, we need to revisit that one. Um, second one is the applicability of perhaps using the frame uh, shear frame shear wall buildings up to what up to what height do we really consider that and is there is there a height limit that needs to be posed at a higher seismic zone um, things like this um, again it is is some it's it, it ponder we need to ponder a little more we need to develop a few more case studies understand it but there will be clear directions uh, how we want to improve the code in such cases there is always scope for improvement thank you rupa you you touched on on very important points on 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 slab contribution and and effective width and that goes together with the anticipated level of lateral deformation and and there are some really tough issues that that we need to look at related to that. Uh, there was a question by Mo Wang on, on the different types of isolators used in Turkey. Morgan, I don't know if you can comment on that. Yeah, and so uh, Professor Miranda, I think you provided a written answer and, and that was correct. So we saw a Turkish manufactured type of uh, a pendulum, I believe a double curvature type of pendulum in at least the buildings we looked at. 
but I know that the hospital team probably looked at some additional ones and, and therefore probably have a little more information on some of the variety of, um, you know, isolators that were used in, in that region. Thank you, Morgan. Yeah, Morgan, we... I, I would like to correct it because it's a little bit of a sensitive issue here. Um, we did see two curved surfaces for the other type of isolators, friction pendulum isolators. We are, aren't sure they are indeed double curvature because they double curvature means that it slips at different levels. And uh, I'm not sure if that was the case for the Turkish uh, isolator provider. So just a small clarification. Thank you, Rupa. Th there was uh, another question regarding um, the, the prevalence of shear walls. Uh, in, in general, what's, what sort of percentage do you think of, of buildings that you observed had shear walls as opposed to this, this uh, frames or, or with, with uh, flat slabs? Um, I maybe I can try to answer that question. There were in most of the buildings we have seen there were shear walls. Um, we can't uh, we don't we didn't have the plans to all of these buildings, so it was possible for us to make a determination whether these uh, buildings could be considered as dual systems. Um, there were only a very small number of buildings that we have seen without any shear walls. Um, but um, in some cases, we felt like uh, there was uh, only a very small fraction uh, of the floor plan or the lateral force resistance system as a shear wall. And uh, in those cases, the shear walls were heavily uh, damaged. I think Ali uh, showed a few slides where um, the shear walls kind of saved the building, but they were very heavily damaged. So uh, we felt like in some cases that the shear walls weren't um, sufficient uh, in these buildings. Thank you. A anybody that would like to add to, to that? Okay, if not, let, let me move to another question. Uh, Dr. Khatib asked about the, if, if you observe some liquefaction around some of these buildings. And, and, and before you answer, I'll, I'll take advantage to, to invite everyone to this, the webinar that we will have next week by GEAR. Um, they sent three different teams and one of their focus was on liquefaction. So, so there will be a lot of very interesting uh, observations and they capture really unique uh, images and information. Uh, so I invite everyone to participate in that uh, webinar next week, which you can attend with the same link that you attended this one. Uh, along the same lines, uh, GEAR team has a very detailed descriptions and uh, uh, GEAR ERI um, uh, report. So our team spent some time in Golbashi and Iskenderun where there was quite a bit of liquefaction. And Rupa and I had a little bit of uh, uh, introductions today. So in general, structures did okay. They either tilted or sunk in if if there was liquefaction or soil failure. But in general, uh, there were very limited structural failures or collapses because of them. So the entire building was sinking in. So geotechnical team has very detailed uh, figures. They show uh, you know how many uh, centimeters uh, the building sunk in, and there are several buildings in Iskander, an area that they spend a lot of time. And there are some numerical examples as well in the uh, in the um, in the report. Thank you, Ali. There was one question uh, asking if uh, Turkish codes require the use of earthquake records, and what records uh, were used. Um, Typically, the, the, the Turkish code is, is very similar to US, especially the latest version, fairly similar in many ways to ASE 7. So most buildings would be uh, designed with equivalent lateral force, many with uh, modal response spectrum analysis. Uh, but I understand it also uh, includes the possibility to do response history analysis. But but I'm not uh, I don't know the details of of how records are selected. Uh, does anybody has information on that? No. Okay. So unfortunately, we we don't have those those details. Um, somebody asked if did you had access to 
a FAD strong data for, for secondary collapse. Short answer, no. It, there's a question that asks about the quality of concrete and, and they ask specifically that it appears from some of the photographs that the concrete uh, fell in chunks. And they ask if uh, using a higher strength uh, concrete would have uh, helped. Uh, definitely, we saw very, very low quality concrete, especially the older the buildings get, the, the, the lower the quality is. To, we have seen very, very, you know, low quality concrete to very high quality concrete. So you can you can imagine the spectrum. So that's a general uh, comment where, you know, as the concrete strength increases, performance uh, uh, gets much better. So uh, can, can you comment on, on the approximate percentage of the one that it's mixed on site versus pre-mixed in, in a manufacturing facility? Uh, I think since 2000, the Tur Turkey del doesn't allow any mixing on site, oh. especially if it is two, three story structures uh, or taller. But we could, uh, we clearly saw some buildings from 70s and 80s. It was mixed on site. You could see those gravels and quality was low. So it was obvious that our teams have seen, uh, team members have seen a lot of uh, buildings with low quality concrete. But in many cases, those are not engineered uh, to begin with. So there were there were old buildings in many cases that contributed, and there was a similar question on uh, inspections and approvals. Uh, clearly, there were uh, problems there, especially in older buildings. Things are getting better and better <laughs> as a function of time. So the older the buildings and structures are, the more problems with uh, inspections and material quality, and uh, the the more recent or the young, the new, newer the buildings are, the better the performance uh, appears to be. So I'll go with one final uh, question by Guillermo Santana, who asked, uh, are there any particular observations relating high PGA uh, sites? And, and were you able to, to establish some correlation of, of level of damage with levels of PGA? Uh, again, maybe I can attempt to answer that question. Uh, the, uh, we have the uh, PGA, PGV, and spectral acceleration values at 0.2 seconds and 1 seconds for the building sites we have visited. One of our um, objectives for the um, upcoming publications, including the earthquake uh, spectra paper, is to do a more detailed analysis of the damage uh, observed uh, and try to correlate it with the, um, the earthquake intensity at that location. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I want to thank everyone and, and to pass it on to Elizabeth, who has a final message for us. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, we've... There we go. Um, so first, I just want to note that there will be a post webinar survey that will pop up in your browser when this session ends. You'll also get it via email tomorrow. We'd really appreciate if you could fill out that response and help us you give us some feedback on this webinar so we can make sure we continue to bring you high quality events in the future. You can learn more about ERI at our website there. And uh, please join us for the upcoming webinars. There's one more in this series next week at the same time with the GEAR team, as people have mentioned. And you, if you're registered for this, you have automatic access to that. We also have a webinar that our younger members uh, committee is organized on June 7th uh, with folks from the Global Earthquake Model Foundation talking about uh, earthquake risk assessment in urban areas. Uh, and you can find the information for that on ERI's website under webinars. And that one you'll need to register for separately. Uh, PDH certificates for this webinar are available at the link here. I've also shared that in the chat and it will be in the email you'll get tomorrow. So if you don't have time to grab it now, don't worry about it. And then finally, I just want to acknowledge and thank our funders, uh, FEMA, which helps sponsor this webinar series. ERI members, like many of yourselves, uh, and the LFE Endowment Fund all help us make events like this possible. So please uh, lend your support in the future if you'd like to see more of these. And thank you again to all of our speakers and to all of the reconnaissance teams uh, and local colleagues who've helped study the impacts of this earthquake.